do you read Cervantes to read about Spanish craziness? <laughs> exactly, there's that double standard. You know, do you read Dostoevsky to read about, you know, how Russians wield axes? Not particularly. Uh, so why would you read an 800-page book about love and think it was specific to any geography? You know, Turkish poetry, because that's my real thing, is part of a huge international debate. It's taking from the West and it's also giving back something. However, often the West isn't listening. Welcome to Pop and Politics, your guide to art and culture in Turkey. I'm your host, Kenan Besat Sharp. Each week, we host an artist, musician, director, writer, actor, or other creative worker in Turkey. And this week, we are joined by Neil P. Doherty. He was born in Dublin, Ireland, and raised in Kildare, a small town in the Irish Midlands. Since 1995, Doherty has resided in Istanbul. He has translated a wide range of Turkish poets and writers, and his translations have appeared in various international journals. In 2015, he was invited to take part in the International Workshop for Translators of Turkish Literature on the island of Junda, where he worked on the poetry of Behçet Nejatigi. In 2017, he was a co-editor of Turkish Poetry Today, published by Red Hand Books in the UK. Both published and soon to be published, he has translations of prose and poetry uh, by Turkish writers Enes Batur, Gönce Özman, Becet Nejatigil. Trained as a teacher of English as a foreign language and having completed a Master's of Philosophy in Implied Linguistics in Trinity College in Dublin, since 2010, he has worked as a lecturer in the EAP department at Bilgi University in Istanbul, where he teaches academic skills to first-year students of psychology. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it's mine. Yeah. Mm. So I want to ask first how you first came to Istanbul, and more importantly, why you decided to stay here. Actually, you put your finger on something very important. <laughs> if people ask me that, you know, like, you know, Abi, why, are, why, why did you come? <laughs> but actually, the real question is why I'm still here. Yeah, why I came is like I've been here for since 1995. So I mean, that, that's a lifetime ago, it's a long, long time ago. Um, and I've been living in Berlin for um, I think about two years before that. And while I love the place and I still go there a lot, uh, I didn't really want to stay there. I, I can't really explain why I didn't want to stay there. Yeah, uh, but I wanted to keep going and for some reason the idea of Istanbul came into my mind probably to do with I, I I knew a lot of Turkish people there and whatever and you know when you're that age I was 22 whatever 23 I was like, well, well why not you know um, and when I got here I had this peculiar people think it's strange but I had this peculiar sense of kind of coming home in a way yeah and when I got here I was like yep I think I think I can stay here where I know a lot of people who come here they look at it as somewhere they stay for a year or two and, you know, whatever. But, I mean, as soon as I got here, um, and there's friends of mine from, like, Bakırköy who can remember this. I started learning Turkish, like, the first, like, day, basically. Because I don't like being in a situation where I've got to go into a shop and say, Do you mean, do you speak English? I don't like that, you know? Um, so, that's why I came. Why I stayed, well, I think you can probably guess, you know, um, marriage... Divorce, <laughs> uh, and of course, I have a daughter, uh, and um, you know, uh, we spend most of our time together. She's you know, with her mother, with me, or whatever. But you know, um, she's not the only thing that keeps me here, um, but she's one of the main things, you know. Um, and you know, we've been through a lot here. You know, I've seen God knows how many earthquakes. Um, <laughs> crises, uh, military, <laughs> military coups, so many things. Um, but I'm still here and um, probably will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did you first discover Turkish literature and then come to translate it? Well, that's a really good question. Um, when you're learning tur Turkish, you know how difficult it is to get past the stage where, okay, you can speak to people. Okay, you can communicate with people. Um, you can understand, you can develop friendships, even relationships. However, reading um, a language that's so far away from your own, um, your mother tongue, takes a long time. Reading takes a while, you know, and you start with simple things. But 
I found it quite frustrating because there were translations of things, um, things I think the, the the what's it called the um, the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Culture uh, used to do these uh, used to support these translations and stuff. I remember reading some of them. Orhan uh, Kemal Yitmish Ikinji Kush. In a, in a translation, and it was really, um, well, I shouldn't say this, but it wasn't <laughs> great. Um, and, you know, because you've got all these friends, you, you start to hear these names because that's what I'm interested in. These are what my friends were interested in. And, you know, um, you know there's a whole wealth there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you have a lot of work to do to get to, you know, a, a level that you can read these things. Um, and then this kind of... <sighs> It wasn't very much of a flow, but this little trickle happened in about the middle of the 1990s with Orhan Pamuk's books um, that were translated. And other things followed very slowly, but I mean, it, it, with Turkish literature up till, say, now, it, it, it would kind of be focused on one figure and then stop, you know? Um, so, I mean, I would walk into bookshops and look at things, and, and basically that was my motivation. Uh, I did start reading quite quickly, uh, relatively quickly, you know, things like, um, like I said, Orhan Kemal, uh, his stories, Said Faik, uh, Aziz Nesin, those things were my first uh, introduction. And also, um, Nazim Hikmet, mm -hmm. um, whom I was um, very interested in. There were translations of Nazim Hikmet, um, some of them quite good, actually. Uh, but again, they were hard to find. Can't get your hands on it. It's not like now where everything is easy. You know, you can Google Nazim Hikmet, you can get all these things in English. You're not in the middle of the 1990s, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Pandora, which has, um, you know, been rendering a wonderful service to um, readers of English, did have some at one stage. And I remember snapping one of them up and then going through them with the Turkish. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, I don't know if I would do that. Yeah, maybe. That's cool. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that's kind of how the whole translation thing started. Not in any sense of, I can do better than you. I don't think any translator would have that or should have that. But there is an element of like, oh, okay, yeah, well, if it was me, I'd do this and I'd change <laughs> this, and, you know. Um, and I think that's where the translation thing uh, came from. And I'm not the first person to say this, by the way, but um, once you start really knowing and understanding what there is in the Turkish language, you get this kind of feeling of anger almost. Why are these things not known outside Turkey? Now, there are many reasons, as you well know, for this. But that was my first feeling was like, okay, particularly with poetry. I remember I had, I bought it in a, a supermarket. <laughs> near my house in Bakırköy, it was um, an anthology of Turkish poetry. It's not Mehmet Fuat's one, it's not the one that came out in Adam, it came out in Broy. Um, I can't remember who edited it. Uh, but you're just going through this and it's like poet after poet after poet. You know, from the start of the Republic until I think it finished with Küçük İskender. Um, and, and you're thinking, except like one or two of them, Nazım and maybe um, Orhan Vili was a little bit, but all these names mean nothing mm. to a reader of English. Nothing at all. And you kind of think, you start thinking, what, why? You know, well, why is this? Why is there so much richness that's left untapped? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to ask about that because, you know, I've heard people say, and I, I agree that if the things we have in Turkish literature were in a language like German or French, which are considered world languages, yeah, even Greek, yeah, even mm -hmm. Greek, they'd be much more known across the yeah. world. What what is this that this wealth still isn't tapped? You know, it's, it's not really. Better, but it's much better. Um, there's still so much, though. I mean, uh, I would even go as far as uh, German and French. Definitely, I agree with you. But even into languages like uh, Polish, mm -hmm. Czech, or Greek, um, they're relatively well translated. I mean, you go to any bookstore anywhere in the English-speaking world, you'll find like lots of different versions of Kafafis, Kafafi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll find um, what's his name, um, Seferis. Uh -huh. You'll Yannick find Ritzos. Uh, um, Ritzos and the other one, Elitis. Mm -hmm. And you'll find anthologies of Greek work. You'll find like 
Polish poets, like to beat the band, basically, you know. Uh, Czech as well, particularly I think these ones did well when the wall came down, the Berlin Wall came down and, and, and the whole perestroika mm. years. Turkish poetry didn't get to ride the coattails of that, you know. And that moment, which I think might be happening now, hasn't really happened. And it was always been sidelined. Um, so the question that I ask myself, and I still ask myself, and it's what you're asking me, is why is Yanis Ritsos relatively well known to you know, serious readers of poetry. But for example, uh, Mili Jivdat Andai isn't. Uh, is it? Is it a difference in quality? Is it that Mili Bey, Mili Jivdat Andai is so much, you know, inferior to uh, Yanis Ritsos? No, that is not the case. You know, or Oktay Rifat, or Edip Jansever, or Gülten Akın, or any of these names. No. Um, so, what's the answer to the question? <laughs> Um, the view of the Turkish people who are not capable of doing these things, that these things are beyond. I've heard these things in, you know, in, in kind of, not, not said directly, but indirectly and hinted at, you know, um, that maybe Turkey doesn't produce great poets. And that's something Turkey itself prides itself on. Of course. We yeah. don't have great novelists. You'll hear this still, but we've great poets, which is completely correct. Um, or then some people would say, well, Turkish is, untranslatable, not any more than Greek or Polish or German for that matter. Of course. You know, Rilke in English is difficult, you know. Um, but I think there's a definitely, definitely a political aspect to it. There's a historical thing. Still um, a view of the, the Turk, um, which I think colors this a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're sometimes, when you're presenting say something Turkish to the West. It needs to be very Turkish, if you know what I mean. They or something the, authentic and yeah, you know, colorful. Exactly. <laughs> Oriental, mm -hmm. you know, something that deals with if it, it sometimes it needs to deal with Turkish issues or what the West perceives as Turkish is, issues, but not not uh, universal one. And that's a classic problem, right? Yes. Americans or yeah. English people or whoever else can talk yeah. about universal issues, but if yeah. you're from a, yeah. a smaller country, quote yes. unquote. A, a smaller country and what is sometimes called a, a minor language, mm -hmm. you know, um, that they have to deal with their own situation, their own ills. I think it was um, Orhan Pamuk who said, after which book it was, yes, uh, Masumiyet Müzesi, uh, the Museum of Innocence. Somebody asked him, you know, the book is about, I'm paraphrasing and kind of semi-remembering this, but the, the kernel is correct, you know, about Turkish love. He said, there's no such thing as <laughs> Turkish love. There's like, you know, do you read Cervantes to read about Spanish craziness? <laughs> exactly, there's that double standard. You know, yeah. do you read Dostoevsky to read about, you know, how Russians wield um, axes? <laughs> Not particularly, you know? Uh, so why would you read an 800-page book about love and think it was specific to any geography? I mean, that's the question. I ask myself as a translator, and I think anybody um, who's involved in this, uh, all of us ask this question, you know, uh, and try to just show through what we're doing. It's like, no, you know, Turkish poetry, because that's my real thing, is part of a huge um, international debate. You know, it's, it's, it's, it's taking from, you know, the West, and it's also giving back something. Mm. However, often the West isn't listening. You know, back in Orhan Veli's time, all these guys, they, they knew French. They were translating um, all kinds of things, you know. Um, I mean, everybody knows Orhan Veli's collected poems, but he's got another book, um, which a dear friend g uh, gave me as a gift recently, was his, tra his collected translations. Like, wonderful. And it's not just French, it's, okay, obviously he was using French as what you might call a bridge language. But he's aware of, like, say, you know, Chinese poetry or Hungarian poetry um, or all these things. But the question, or no, not the question, the, the issue is that, you know, um, these people whom they were translating are not aware or sometimes even interested in, you know, what was happening here. These wonderful movements, uh, I mean, I know you've written about them as well, you know, Garip and the Kinjiine, the second new, these are hugely important 
Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. You know? And it's really in the mainstream of world literature. They're aware of everything, they're responding to everything, it, adding something new. Yes. Some, uh, something precious and new. Yeah. I mean, that even goes back to um, Nazem Hikmet. If you look at Nazem Hikmet's, um, the, the book, his first published book when he comes back from, from Russia, it's probably his first published book anyway. Um, 635 lines, uh, which needs to be translated entirely as a single volume. Um, this is part of the great kind of, you know, um, zeitgeist of this time. It's you have the, you know, modernism, futurism. Nazim was very aware of like futurism, you know, Marinetti and all these guys in Italy. Um, and he'd taken in a very interesting way these, um, the way of structuring the verse from Mayakovsky. But it's not much like Mayakovsky. In fact, when you read Nazim, you, you see that a lot of the, the, the, the, the rhymes and the internal rhymes actually have a lot to do with say things like folk song, mm -hmm. Turku, you know, rather than, you know, what Mayakovsky was doing, you know. And Nazim took these without really knowing Russian particularly well, so he just took the way the, the verse was stepped and, and made it his completely his own. And it's a powerful, powerful weapon still, you know. Um, so yes, there's an element <laughs> of frustration that these things aren't known, but that's common to everybody who's engaged in this, um, Absolutely. you know, art. Um, but it is sad, you know. Um, I'm sure people in, in, in Greece would think that their literature is under-translated, and it probably is, you know. But you still, I think, get a, a better deal, if you know what I mean. It's still, they're an easier sell in the West than what, what, what we have here. Mm, absolutely. Sadly, and I really like to say the opposite, but I can't, you know. Yeah. So you were talking a minute ago about the rhyme structure of, of Nazi Mikvet, for example. I'm curious about these formal things. What are the technical difficulties when it comes to translating Turkish literature mm. into, into English? There are many. Yeah. <laughs> there are many. And especially it's yeah. interesting because you yeah. work on a lot of experimental or yeah. more difficult modernist poetry. Yeah. Which is the hardest thing to translate. Gil. Yes. Tell yeah. me about him a little bit. Bechet Nejati Gil is a poet who um, I was lucky enough to work on in Jumda. Um, our very dear uh, Salia Pakesh, who's um, been responsible for so many wonderful translations and, and bringing so many people together. Uh, and she invited me in 2005. And um, we were a few of us, I think, nine, ten. Uh, it worked like there was a p prose group and a poetry group. And we were working on Bichit Nejatigil, which was really exciting because I think he's completely unique. I don't really know any poet like him in any other language. It's, it's, he's totally unique. Yes, there are elements of, he, he, he spoke and read German very well and translated from German. There are elements of German romanticism and modernism, but it's his very, very own thing. And it's one of those, he's one of those poets that uses Turkish in, in, in a way that frustrates you as a translator because he packs a lot into very little. Yeah. Uh, and it's sound, and it's his own way of, you know, it, I mean, every great poet does this. They create their own sound world and their own uh, linguistic world, and he does it hugely uh, successfully. Uh, and my my friend, uh, Gökçen Urche, uh, who's another um, very well-known poet, he was there as a translator, and we, we kind of um, formed a, a little group, you know, just the two of us, like a, a pair, uh, and I think we worked in a similar way because we we we um, paid a lot of attention to the sound, trying to get these, you know, inner rhymes and and make it short. English can be quite ponderous; it can go on, you know. But you got to cut things out. Um, so my models for that would be things like, you know, Williams, Carlos Williams, and you know, uh, Robert Creeley, and these American kind of modernists who are who are taking, you know chunks of language away and seeing what's left. Nijati Gil does this, did it before them, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, and, and technically, I think we, ha we, ha we worked together, we bounced ideas off each other, but we worked aloud and we listened to the line and then we listened to what we were doing in English. And it's like chipping away. That doesn't happen overnight. Some of them did, um, but mostly no. Uh, they don't. W with with each poem and each poet, there comes a new technical 
challenge. Uh, with Milijev that Anlai, um, and I have done some of his, they're the longer, more philosophical poems. When you read them at first, you think, well, they're going to translate quite easily, but they, they don't. They don't, because again, there'll be some little thing in one line. It could be something like a pun or, you know, Turkish turns very quickly. Mm -hmm. The thought moves very quickly and to keep English moving, that's, that's a technical problem. Is it always, um, can you always overcome these technical problems? No, <laughs> no, nor should you actually, you know, not everything works. Some things just resist translation immediate, you know, in, in the, you know, when you, when you start first, I think eventually uh, you, you could do it, but sometimes you've got to just let things, you know, them lengthen, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, like tea, just let, let them draw, it steep. let yeah. steep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, because a translation takes a long time, you know. Um, when you look at, you know, it takes poets a long time to write a book. You should not sit down and translate a book in a month. You, it's not honest and it's not going to be particularly good, mm. you know. I mean, I look back at stuff that I did, say, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, and I'm like, not really. <laughs> no, like you miss this. or it, it, It's not that you miss things in the Turkish, which you do, by the way, or when you read it out loud, it becomes completely different. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like you're looking at the English and going, no, you really have no. You know, um, but I think, you know, over time, um, and I keep working on things, you know, uh, I, I never really drop things. Um, like, you start on something, you are, you know, because we've got a busy life here, you know. You work on things, you move on to something else, you work on that, you go back to it, you polish up what you've done, you, you I hope, improve it, <laughs> you know? Um, these kind of things. But the technical challenges, I mean, it, it, it, it varies from poet to poet. With, with Nazim, it's getting those, those very beautiful end rhymes, but not in some kind of artificial, awful kind of Victorian way. <laughs> not, not that. He's not like that, as you know, you know? But then... You know, some of the other poets that interest me will be the ones before him, like uh, Ahmed Hashim. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the first step into modernism from, say, you know, late Ottoman, from, you know, Efik Fikret and all those people. It's something quite new. It's very new, actually. Uh, but again, they're, they're, they're, they're using the old meters and you've got to come up with something in English. You can't free translate. You can't just do that freely, you know, because it's... What, what what you present if you do that is, is something radically different from what say Hashim or mm -hmm. Yahya Kemal were doing. Yeah. Um, so basically, there's no there's no easy one, and as you know, the the languages are radically different and work in different ways. You know, sometimes you get very envious of the Turkish language. You say, oh, "You've done that with like three words." <laughs> <laughs> Why do I have to spend like 15 to say the same thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, you, you solve them as they come up. I, I'm not a very, what's the word? I don't shy to one particular uh, philosophy of translation. I don't really think that you can. You know, some poems you've got to, or you can, should I say, um, stick with it relatively, cl you know, closely and what comes out is usually okay. Sometimes you've got to almost engage in rewriting. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you've got to go more, I suppose it's a cliche, but you've got to go more for the spirit than the letter, yeah, if absolutely. you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah? Um, last of all, I wanted to ask you about current projects you're working on, things you're excited about. I lots, there's several things. Lots of things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they are very exciting, actually. Uh well, there's two projects by Enes Batur that I've been involved uh, in for quite a long time, actually. Can you uh, tell, tell our viewers really briefly who Enes Batur yeah, is? Exactly. Enes Batur is um, a senior poet and, and writer. He writes um, essays, um, novels, so they're very strange novels, um, um, poetry, travelogues. He writes a lot. I mean, he's known in Turkey as like the most productive writer in the Turkish language. Um, and he was involved in Yapkridi, Yayin Lüri, in the publishing house there. So a publisher, author, um, intellectual, 
Now, the Junda um, group, our Junda group, um, and you know, it's people like uh, Mel, Kenny, um, Cliff, and Selhan, Endres, Salia, Pakar, and Gökçe, Nur, uh, Che, and myself, we um, undertook Batur in 2016, I think it was. Um, and we, we translated um, quite a lot of his poems. Uh, he came and visited us uh, twice, I think. Uh, he was very, very glad that we were translating his work, I think, and he, he, made, he, he made us you know, feel that, you know. Um, and we, we, we kind of gathered them together and then left them there just to kind of settle. But it, they settled for quite a long time. And then it was Cliff who rang me, I think it was in the first or second month of the pandemic, and he said, we got to get these out there. And I would say, yes, we do. So we worked on them, we polished them, uh, and we, we brought them into book form. And it's about 110, 20 pages in a book. I don't know exactly. And these are longer poems. And this is unusual because a lot of, um, you know, collections of Turkish poetry or anthologies go for the shorter lyric mm -hmm. ones. These are all the dramatic monologues. They're long poems. They're, um, some of them are quite difficult. There are lyric elements and there are some lyric poems in there as well, but it's a very important collection. Uh, and we are looking for a publisher at the moment. Um, Which is always yeah. the most difficult part. Yeah, well. we have had a few, don't like the word, rejections, but um, that's par for the course. Hopefully, uh, somewhere will, um, some, somebody will publish it, you know. And oddly enough, at the same time during the pandemic, uh, I translated his Kitab Evi, which I render as the House of Books, which is a novel. But his novels are very strange as novels. They're, um, they're kind of like essayistic novels. And this one deals with um, um, bibliophilia. Um, the, the character gets left um, um, a house full of books, which are like a library. Um, and how he deals with that. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a very dramatic work, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's finished, it's finished a while ago, uh, and again, uh, finding a publisher. Yeah, of course. Then there's, there's more. Um, <laughs> uh, almost, almost, I have almost completed Gonja Uzman's uh, third collection of poetry, which in Turkish has the most wonderful title, Bile Istia. Yeah. This is a challenge in itself. How to translate that? Well, you can only really go with, I've talked to a lot of people about this, um, knowingly, willfully, willingly, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, a one word solution won't do there, you know, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very important collection. Um, she's technically very interesting too, because she has lots of uh, elements of, um, you know, these kind of like tongue twisters and rhymes and nursery rhymes and, and almost elements um, of like Türkü folk song um, and, and lots of very interesting, um, you know, rhymes and half rhymes and internal rhymes, which are, yeah, make life difficult for the uh, translator. Mm. But most of the poems are finished. Uh, it's going to, to need, um, you know, me to proof it and edit it and then polish it to uh, you know level that I think yes that that, that will definitely uh, uh, do but a, mo a lot of them have been published in in um, in journals outside Turkey and some good news actually one of them has been accepted by the modern poetry uh, in translation mm. which is the you know the magazine that Ted Hughes established which is really important mm. getting Turkish poetry in there is something that um, I said we should all be really aiming for. Again, you, you you are faced with the same problems, but it oh, it does happen, and it has happened. You know? It's especially good to get the work of a living poet in journals like that. Absolutely, too. it's it's a must. And I mean, I I think we will find publishers for for all of these things that I'm talking about. But with Enes Botur and the Gonja Özman book, these are single collections. These are not anthologies. You can always fob off a minor. I don't like this word, but you know what I mean. Literature with anthology. Now, anthologies are fine. Okay, but what we need to show, you know, the variety and strength of poetry here are single volumes by living poets. 
Having said that, the last <laughs> the last thing <laughs> is um, th- th- there's a and I should mention them and thank them. Uh, the Antonym, they're a, a, an online poetry journal, a literature journal based in India, and they've got um, also based in the United States. And their attitude to Turkish poetry is completely wonderful and refreshing because it's like, just, just send us more. It's like what you expect from everybody, but you don't get, you know? But they, they, they I think, it's not, not I think, I know, they don't bring the same prejudices with them at all, you know? So for the last year and a half, or my brain has been scrambled because of the pandemic. I, my sense of time is gone. But let's say a year and a half, maybe two years, they've been publishing my translations of different poets on and off. Um, and all kinds of interesting figures, like um, the next one that I think is due next month, which is April, uh, Sabet Din Kudret Aksal, who's a, another wonderful, uh, and even in Turkish, kind of forgotten poet. Uh, they published some of the Nijatigil translations I did with Gökçenur in Junda. And um, I sent them some more and they're suggesting some way of publishing them in book form. But mm. none of that is finalized. It's uh, something we need to talk to them about, but they're interested. You know, to get someone interested in this is even difficult. Absolutely. Know? Instead of the rejections, the rejections, the rejections. You know, yeah. so I'd like to thank uh, the people in the Antonym for you know their support because support is vital. You know, uh, thank you much, thank you very much, guys, for for this. And it is, like I said, really refreshing uh, to get this kind of interest. Mm-hmm. You know, I just one other thing is I I know a lot of you know uh, poets outside Turkey, people who are you know serious practitioners of of poetry. And when I share these translations with them and I talk to them, they're always bowled over by the quality of the poetry. You know, as so some friends of mine in Ireland, uh, some of them are, are um, uh, you know, pretty important people in the Irish poetry world. They're like, oh, this is amazing. Stuff. Like, we, we need this. Stuff. And they're very aware of the difficulty of getting things published. You know, I mean, in Ireland, where I come from, of course, there's a lot of poetry, and of course, a lot of poetry publishing, but um, it, it's it's it's not as um, you know you've, you, you've there are some big publishing houses, but none of them because Ireland is small, uh, none of them are as big, say, as um, some of the big ones in the UK or or the states, you know. But you know, opening these doors is difficult, but we will continue to knock. Absolutely, you yeah. know. Neil, thanks so much for coming oh, on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great. It's a real know. pleasure. And maybe, uh, maybe somewhere, someone will listen and, you know, start translating. Because we need more translators. I would like to say that as well. We need more of them. Absolutely. There are some of us doing it. Uh, and, you know, that's wonderful. But, you know, more, you know, Turkish native speakers, English native speakers, I think in this globalized world, it doesn't really matter. You know, just people who are committed. You've got to be a little bit... Um, <laughs> you got to be a little bit crazy. Really. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, I tell my friends, it's like, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I wake up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and I, I'm like, ah, it's that word. It's the eureka moment. You know? <laughs> you know? And sometimes it's just a word or even a particle, you know? Like, it shouldn't be to there. It should be in. Oh, the, the line works. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So let's hope for more translators crazy and more people. eureka moments. Yes, and more crazy exactly. People. Thank you for having me. My it's pleasure. been wonderful. Okay.